Recording. Hope is a spiritual mechanism that needs to be fed each day, even in a system that is flawed. We always find a different way. Let me tell you a story with and without the glory. Times of Tuskegee studies, chemtrails that made St. Louis muddy, one plantation, two families embedded, house small, enslaved and indebted. The monumentous, complete unfair, the unholy mistreatment of care, once upon a measure, with no remedy or treasure. Looking at the overall score, our help is behind a closed door. Hope has been whipped to the floor, the idea and prayer of nevermore. Let me tell you a story with and without the glory. Nothing of unbiased training, the lack of true understanding, the depth of unprecedented handling, the current whys that we are managing. The unrepresented stand to represent with all but a quorum of 13%. Keeping time with segregated tactics and history's repeated enactment. The falseness of the hypothesis begat the biased antithesis of a bigoted racial small-mindedness that unfortunately continues to exist. Let me tell you a story with and without the glory when disparities are recognized and education is mobilized. It's tough to fight off the reprieve when we feel still on our knees. Systematic occurrences to remind more in honesty is somewhat hard to find. Spaces in the spirit and in the mind, places too haunted to define. Being confused, misled, and so confined amidst the history's dissertation of time. The story is old, so it's been told that we, the chosen, are also to be the bold. Hope is a spiritual mechanism that needs to be fed each day, even in a system that is flawed. We always find a different way. Thank you. This is a global health crisis of a deadly virus. But you have the opportunity to protect yourself. You don't have to contract it. You can get the vaccine. Go in and get your vaccination and protect yourself against the original strain and as well as these variants that are coming up. Get the vaccine. Get the facts. Get the vax. <laughs> get the get the get the vaccine. Get the vaccine. Well, it may protect you or it may not. I mean, what the hell are we getting the vaccine for? And that just puts more pressure on one to like, uh, oh, which one? What do I do? What do I do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Still debating.
go back in time, uh, Onis Simmons uh, was actually a uh, African slave who was a slave of Cotton Mather, who uh, was in Boston around seven, uh, the year 1700. And Cotton Mather was a preacher. So he asked uh, Onis Simmons, what is it uh, that we can do about this smallpox that's coming over here? And he said, I, I think I have a solution. He said, what you do is you take a very, very small amount of it from people who are infected and you actually stick them with a, a piece of metal and you can actually uh, start to develop some immunity. And what Omar Simmons didn't tell him is that this had been practiced in Africa for over a thousand years. Wow. And passed down from family to family. So we are actually the originators of vaccines back in Africa. Catherine Harris, growing up in the polio vaccine. <clears throat> We talked about it amongst our neighborhood, on our street, in our community, at our church, and you know every everybody got it. Uh huh. And because even the uh, the vaccine clinics, if they were not at school, I mean, if you didn't have anyone at school, then you know where where else would you go? And and a lot of times, the vaccine clinics were set up at at the churches in the in the neighborhood. I remember some of the commercials on TV. I guess the FDA existed. I'm sure the FDA existed at that time. And, you know, those um, departments of government that provide o approval for new meds. But the children, I remember getting my polio vaccine and the booster. I, I don't recall my mom or my parents having any questioning about it because they told us you're going to do this because it's going to be available to you. Sadly, I did have a friend who had to be in the iron lung. I don't know wh what happened to him and why he had to do that. Mm -hmm. But he was in an iron lung for, I guess, for a number of years or months. And it was during the time of the polio, the polio scare. Mm, because it was sort of what it was was coined as that term uh -uh, right it was called the polio scare and folks really didn't know or john q public i'm sure the scientists and the virologists and all those kind of people they probably knew the the epidemiology of it but regular people on the street didn't and so it was scary mm -hmm. and then i also remember when we got the uh the uh you put it, the Sabin, the Sabin vaccine. That was for polio too, but it was put on a sugar cube and it, you just dissolved it in your mouth. And that, I was probably like in the, maybe the seventh grade then. Uh -huh. And why we had to get both of them, I don't really know, but my mom and dad said, well, you're gonna get that too. If they're giving it at school, it has to be okay. Mm -hmm. So that did not indicate distrust. The journalist in me is coming out, but how was the reaction when you know you were in school and the world around you? I know you said you were in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. How was the world then compared to how the world is now? Oh my goodness, let me see. TV hadn't been around all that long. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you got your news from the newspaper mm -hmm. or you got your news from your neighbor. Wasn't a 24 hour news. No, cycle. oh, there was no 24 hour news. In fact, the TV went off at 12 o'clock midnight and then you got that screen pattern. Oh, that, that <laughs> noise. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was kind of bad. Mm -hmm. But um, um, everyone in, in my community, I mean, we all had the polio vaccine. Uh, and you did have to bring a note from your parents signed, you know, to give to the visiting nurse or whatever, whoever they were from the public health department, you know, you did have to have permission to do this. So we were not um, just being vaccinated willy nilly without, uh, without parental consent. Now I'm trying to remember if there was anyone, at least in my grade, I don't remember anyone who did not take the vaccine. It also made me think about what happened to Henrietta Lacks. Do you know that story? I do know that story. Uh -huh. Please, please share it with us. And uh, because she was 
unaware as to what the physicians and the researchers at Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. Medical School were doing to her. Henrietta Lacks became a, uh, huh, I'm not sure what you would call her, because she was a, she was a martyr, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. they, they never told her what they were doing, the things they were doing, <coughs> and why. However, her contribution mm -hmm. to medical history, <coughs> insofar as a cancer screening and, and all of that, mm -hmm. You know, it was significant. I believe that, if memory serves me correctly, that her her children mm -hmm. sued. Yeah, they I, I, and they got a pretty good award. We have not always been a community that gets uh, first class treatment because we're first of all viewed oftentimes as second class citizens, even though we are all Americans. But some folks get more. Uh, cred <laughs> than, than others. So um, we have historically been um, kind of the last ones, but in some instances we were the first ones to get to be used for human testing. That did um, show some, um, let's see, ig 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 ignoring uh, non-caring, untruthful, not being totally disclosed as to what was going on. So that does have some bearing on why uh, folks are not necessarily too gung-ho about uh, getting new treatments. I absolutely am glad and, and, and I think one of the things that a lot of people have experienced is we're thinking that at some point they may be a carrier of it. It's sort of that the initial isolation and then the 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 thought pattern and the process and it's up and until you actually go and you seek out uh, you know your provider's assistance and and say hey I, I need to get this I need to get tested where can I go to get tested and, and so I can have these results because these are the things that I'm experiencing Absolutely. and I'm gonna be honest with you I'm freaking the f out I also want to like, touch on like the apprehension. It's like I also understand like where the apprehension comes from. Like not only as you know a black person, but I guess like um, I guess I can like actually say like as a black person, like I get it. Vincent Chappelle. I am a historical curator and researcher um, here in Springfield, Illinois, um, and I'm also on the board at the African American History Museum where we are now. You think about people like J. Marion Sims. Um, you know, who is known as like the modern day father of like gynecology and how he actually did a lot of his experiments on black women um, without anesthesia. He's like when white people go into like these professions, like medical professions, they are not properly taught how to deal with and care for black and brown people. Um, for centuries now, you know, experiments have been done on black people. Um, like I mentioned, you know, like aforementioned, um, when I talk about like J. Marion Sims, who was not only someone who was doing experimentation on black bodies, particularly black women, but he was also a slaveholder himself. When you think about people like Henrietta Lacks, whose sales are still being used today in a multitude of this things. This show close up, by the way. Oh, mm -hmm. today. In mm -hmm. a multitude of ways, um, her sales are still being utilized. Even her children's sales, I mean, had they were being experimented on without their consent in the 1970s. Mm. Um, so it's just, the apprehension is there. I mean, even the Tuskegee experiment, um, 600 black men were like literally experimented on and like used as like, you know, pin cushions for needles. And these are practices that have kind of continued even under the radar. Like we are not taken seriously at all and it's almost as if they don't believe that black people are being serious when we say oh we're in pain or we're feeling this and even into the 21st century and the point that we are now um you can still find you can still find articles or like just like about black people just dropping dead because the doctors wouldn't listen 
it's almost like it's a, what do you want to call it? Kind of a classification thing. There's economics. It's with how you look. Mm -hmm. Can you pay your bills? You look like you can't pay your bills. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll we'll give you this. You can go to this doctor, but you're gonna have to pay this much. We'll pay this much, but you're gonna pay this much. Those type things. Um, I know people that are very ill, and they don't have the money. Um, and it's sad, our elderly, the homeless, you know, what about them? And what more do I need to say? 602,000 lives have been lost at that point in our country. And when I was sitting there, I was thinking about it and I was like, wow, what would have happened if we had the vaccine in December of 2019? Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold. And the number of affected countries has tripled. There are now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries and 4,291 people have lost their lives. Thousands more are fighting for their lives in hospitals. In the days and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases, the number of deaths, and the number of affected countries climb even higher. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It's a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. We have rung the alarm bell loud and clear. We cannot say this loudly enough, or clearly enough, or often enough, all countries can still change the course of this pandemic. Can you go ahead and provide me your first and last name? Claron Sharif. I work as an administrative assistant. Why do you choose not to or choose to receive the vaccine, that being the COVID-19 vaccine? Honestly, right now, I'm at a stage where I'm still deciding. Somebody mentioned, oh, this coronavirus is going to spread. Somebody at work said it, and I was like, no, it's not. We're worried about one virus, and boom, lockdown. Okay, we're all going home. We're working, working from home now. Mm -hmm. That's when it got real for me the first time. And when they talked about the governor, lock and, lockdown and, 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 and curfews, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, so now we gotta live indoors. This is not gonna be a couple of months, it could be a year, it could be two, it could be five. I'm not getting any younger, you know, and as you get older, your immune system is, decreases. So um, I have to take that into consideration, that bothers me, you know. I still gotta wear this thing, you know, to somewhat protect myself, Absolutely. constantly washing my hands, sanitizing. It's like, gosh, do I have any skin left? It's <laughs> <laughs> and so, and it was scary, you know, this. What, what kept that mental, mental piece really positive for you during the period of, of you know, when we went through our lockdown? Talking to my friends, my children, 
listening to, there's a couple of people I like. To, uh, Ayala Van Zant's one of my favorites. She's my spiritual online guru. But there, I had some moments too because I had a sick husband. The pandemic was going on. And I can promise you, one day things got so hectic because everything was falling on me. I stood in the middle of my kitchen and I just started walking around in a circle. I'm like, I don't know what to do. What do I do? I, I, I'm, I gotta take care of him. I gotta take me and me. I gotta go to work. I gotta pay the bills. I gotta clean the house. I gotta go back there and make sure he's okay. I gotta take him to appointments. That's a lot. That's why I say this. It's very influential. It's easy to mold. It's easy to brainwash. Mm. It's easy to fight back. Well, it's not as easy to fight back, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So that's sort of been that the bigger challenge is making sure that the mental health yeah, mental and mental balance is, is, especially, is, is especially Especially during this pandemic. And this might sound crazy to some people, but I have a lot of out loud self conversations, talking to myself. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I had a lot of those too. Okay. But yeah. If you listen to yourself and some things I learned about myself and I was like, oh, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. It's like a shock. You it know? is. So, yeah, it's a challenging time. It still is. Is there something that could convince you to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, I, you know, I've had a lot of friends that have had it, not just black folks, uh, white folks, you know, Latinos. And everybody seems to be doing quite well, which is good. Mm -hmm. But then I can't help but think, okay, what happens down the line? Or mm. was there a placebo given? I don't know what's in it. Of course, I didn't know what was in the booster shot when I was a child that I got. I don't know what was in the DTP shot that I received who, back in February. Um, I guess, you know, you hear things and the fact that it was manufactured in what, 30 days, I think they said, something like that. That's kind of quick. But then you think, well, maybe quick is good. I'm one of those people, I think one thing and then I think something else, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, it's kind of like that balanced thinking where yeah. it's like, uh, but. Uh. Yeah. And I kind of feel like I'm stuck behind in the times because I'm still, you know, there's a lot of us still walking around with the mask, but mm -hmm. you know, with the mask, I'm like, oh, I can't be that free right now. Uh, I should just run and just go take it, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's nice to see people's faces again, you know. Uh, it's nice to see someone say hi to you, regardless of their color. It's just nice, but you know, sometimes I feel like I'm being judged, like, you didn't get vaccinated? Why are you still wearing that? You know, I don't know what they're thinking. They may not even be thinking about me at all. And, you know, and some of us feel that, is it to take out the black population? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not. I don't know. It does make you wonder though. Why did you choose to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? I was extremely apprehensive at first mm -hmm. um, due to a multitude of things, including some things that we've heard about in history. If you don't mind, would you mind kind of sharing some personal maybe apprehensions? In Absolutely. Um, I, it was just like the fear of not knowing, um, like how it would affect me. Um, you know, the things that I'd heard or like uh, certain accounts that were like mentioned like in the media, et cetera. And I think also knowing that there were black scientists and doctors on the teams developing these vaccines kind of helped with the decision as well. Like it was like a, a leap of faith, kind of, just because it's just like, um, okay, here's a cure is, or maybe not necessarily a cure, but at least a vaccine. Um, so it took me a minute to like make a really, really informed decision. Like when it comes to like the facts, like we usually have to like go find the facts ourselves because when it comes to like medical practice, like medical practice is like very unfair when it comes to black people sometimes. And honestly, up until like maybe 25, like I didn't really see black medical professionals that mm. often. Mm -hmm. And it actually took me like being hospitalized myself 
in South Carolina for me to even realize like, oh, there are black people who do this. And it's, like, it's not that I didn't know, but it's just, it's very rare moments throughout my life where I've actually like seen a black doctor. Before I share it, uh, bef well one, um, at one particular point in time, like I was actually paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and on the left side of my body, and I also experienced vocal paralysis um, due to Guillain-Barre. Um, so there were a lot of things that I had to learn to do again on my own, like even, you know, walking, um, speech therapy, even music therapy. I was away in South Carolina at a school called Allen University. It's an HBCU. Go Allen. <laughs> Yellow Jackets. Um, and I had entered an uh, internship at another university um, in the case study. It was in the epidemiology department, and the case study was uh, healthcare discrimination mm -hmm. based on age and race. And it wasn't something that I thought that uh, would become a uh, reality for me, yeah. causing me to not only give up the internship, but just, you know, to be laid up in a hospital with doctors who were not black and not listening to me. Um, at one particular point in time, um, because I have like marks on my legs from like, you know, mosquito bites, et cetera, yeah. you know, growing up and things like that. Um, those particular doctors, there were three of them whose names I will not say, of course. Um, they thought that they were track marks. So they were trying to say that I was like shooting up in my legs. So um, they berated me with questions for about 15 to 20 minutes trying to figure out if I was telling the truth or not. And the thing was that they saw me and they saw like this young black kid just laid up in the hospital bed and there was nobody there with me to advocate for me. So I pretty much had to learn to do so for myself. But one thing I've noticed like even with myself is like the shock factor. It's like the shock factor shouldn't be there. Like I should, of, of, of like seeing a black doctor oh my God, yeah. and it's like, and like what I mean is like, you know, it's like, you know, it should be more black people in like the medical field should be like more normalized. Yes. I shouldn't be shocked, but also happy to see you like the shock factor shouldn't be there. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, it's like it, and it's like almost like a sigh of relief mm -hmm. that like comes over you because it's like, OK, I know that there is like a greater chance that you will take care of me. We go back to the the historical historical aspects and the trauma that's associated with that. And we really have to deal with that as a community. Everybody does. Um, but what made me decide to actually get the vaccine is I did my research on the, the effects of the vaccines, the efficacy of it. You know, I was intentional about um, just looking up information from the fe federal government, from the state, and I saw that um, the data was showing that it was effective. Um, again, I wasn't 100% you know, sure I was going to get it. But then when I realized how the community was looking to the health department and looking at me specifically for um, that being that trusted leader and to answer those questions, and I saw that people were dealing with so many physical issues that they needed the vaccine to protect themselves. I had to. I made a decision that I was going to do it not just for me, but for my community. Dr. Leslie McKnight, can you go ahead and spell your first and last names uh, out for me, please? Sure. Leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E -E, McKnight, M-C-K-N-I-G-H-T. I am the Director of Community Health Policy and Planning at the Peoria City County Health Department. And my office is responsible for health promotion in the community. Can you share with me actually what we're, what we're in right now, what we're doing? Location is Sophia's Kitchen, mm -hmm. and they provide meals to the community um, for those that are in need. And so uh, the health department, we thought this was a wonderful idea to partner to establish one of our pop-up clinics here as well. So as patrons come in to get their meals, we're able to give them an opportunity to get vaccinated. So we're working with the National Guard, who's actually administering the vaccines for the health department as well. If I have questions about the vaccine, where do I turn, mm -hmm. right, to have a conversation? I would suggest the first primary person that you turn to is your physician. 
Mm -hmm. your, it can be your primary care, it could be your gynecologist, yes. um, it could be your heart doctor, like whoever that um, medical practitioner is, it could be a nurse, is to have a conversation Someone with in a that medical profession, that professional background. because they can talk to you about you know, your medical condition. Getting the vaccine is a medical decision, not a social decision. So I would not recommend you making a medical decision using social media, you know, where you're on Facebook or Instagram and there's these uh, debates and there's this information that ha is not evidence-based. It hasn't been tested. It hasn't been published. It's word of mouth. You know, uh, we have heard so many things about, you know, anecdotal of what the vaccine is. I have a story about a family circle. So this past Father's Day, we did a virtual call with Ooh. my dad for <laughs> this past Father's Day. Mm -hmm. And three of my five siblings are not vaccinated. In the call, um, it came out. And so at first I didn't want to talk about it because I'm a health practitioner and I talk about it every day. And I said, well, this is dad's time and my dad is vaccinated. And so he was trying to talk with my brothers and sisters about the importance of getting vaccinated, but he could only go so far. So I knew this was my moment. So to I took the moment <laughs> Give it to, my dad. to address their concerns and their you know, issues with it. It was such a spectrum that even in my own family that I had to just say, you know, but I'm gonna take the time to deal with each one of them where they're at. So my one brother whose children had never been vaccinated, I had to talk to him about the importance of vaccinations and how it does strengthen the body. Like my dad could not have these conversations. And Dion, we were on the phone about three hours talking about it. You know, out of the three, one of them change their mind and they say, you know what, I'm going to get vaccinated. That's good. So That's that good. was a win. Yes. That's the win that you have is you have to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. You have to talk about um, their concerns because there are many. Even with, you know, the friends and, and, and family members, um, I have taken the position that I will be that trusted role model. And if I, if I can have any influence, that I'm going to take advantage of that. But we are in emergency crisis right now. And all of these emergency declarations you see throughout the world, um, in our state, in our community, there's a reason for that. Because of the high transmission rates and the high mortality rates. So if you get COVID, there is a high probability you may not live. That is a public health crisis. Look at India, where they had mass graves, right? That wasn't just U.S. American blacks. That was a whole population of people that were not protected, did not have access to the vaccines. It was the Delta variant. It spread very quickly, and it was terminal. So this, as, as a globally, is what we're dealing with. So please, I want to encourage you all that are hesitant. Please don't base that hesitancy on what has happened in the past and what has happened in our community. This is a, a pandemic means global. Yeah. This is a global health crisis of a deadly virus. But you have the opportunity to protect yourself. You don't have to contract it. You can get the vaccine. As far as who's actually getting the vaccine, okay, just in Peoria County, our more affluent populations and the people that are not black or indigenous people of color, they have a higher vaccination rates. Their vaccination rates are 70% plus. Now in, those, in our communities of people of color, our vaccination rates are averaging 20, 30%. Okay, so if this was to target our population, it's not working because we're not getting it. And then 
the other part of that is those that are, are not people of color. They're getting it in the masses. So that should tell an individual of color that, well, maybe this isn't just targeted to me in my detriment and my demise. Uh, already, you know, if we look at the life expectancy of people of color, uh, African American males are at the bottom of the list as far as life expectancy, and then followed by uh, white males, and then black females, and then white females. Okay. My name is uh, Dr. Damon Arnold. Uh, I am uh, a medical director at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois um, as part of the Healthcare Services Corporation, HCSC. Uh, which covers five states. As we get these variants, the reason why the SARS is different this time is because it, as it changes the spike proteins on the surface, um, you know, and I'll, I'll show you uh, one of my things. So these are the spike proteins that attach to your cells. And that's what the virus looks like. And so uh, these, these things can change and they can become different types. So you may end up having a blue one or a red one or a purple one. So it's a different, and these are the variants. They start to change. And so they, so you need to develop uh, the vaccine for each one of those, for the different ones. Wow. And so that's why, you know, when this new um, virus came about, the SARS-CoV-2, they already had the technology and the platform to make the vaccine. The, the actual process, phase one, two, and three, included a, a significant amount of African Americans in the studies. Many of us volunteered for it. Uh, it included Asians. It, it crossed the, the, the spectrum of race and ethnicity. I've looked at the uh, t t technology behind it. And uh, some people thought this was really rushed, but you have to understand technological advancements are in science and in medicine are accelerating almost as fast as the uh, technologies you have in your iPhone. You go from generation to generation to generation, and you never even think about it. And But the technology is accelerating faster and fatter, faster, especially with artificial intelligence in the background. Now, with the vaccine production, uh, it is the most studied vaccine ever in history. You have more scientific people looking at this vaccine from every country, every conceivable laboratory you can think of uh, all around the world. Uh, they are so fixed on this because of the threat it poses to the global uh, health. And uh, the vaccines that have been project, you know, produced so far, the mRNA vaccine, what they have been showing over and over again is that this vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, from the standpoint of preventing you from getting uh, hospitalized, being put on the ventilator, and even from dying. As time goes on, the variance uh, will increase, but the more people that are fully vaccinated, the less likely that another variant will arise. When I was in the military, uh, I went over to Iraq and to many different countries, South America, Central America, Europe, uh, you name it, uh, Asia. So when I, when I went there, I got vaccinations three, four, five at a time. And they told me, you know, you don't, you know, you need to take this vaccination to be deployed. So in the army, you know, you don't get much of a choice. They, they say, line up, <laughs> here you go. And they gave you a little a yellow card with the vaccination card. And they said, you lose this card and you will get them again. So we was held, held onto that thing with our dear life. We, we, you know, held in our teeth. We just didn't want anyone to get this card. Uh, so, you know, as we um, went through that, I learned that it was actually protecting me against a lot of diseases that I saw when I went over there. Uh, when I went to Africa for one of our missions, I saw a polio ward where they still have polio overseas. And it is a devastating disease. One of the things I was worried about was not being able to provide uh, for my family and making sure that my wife was secure. So I would have lost, if I died early, I lost my pension. I would have lost my uh, 401k. I would have lost my social security, everything I've been paying into for decades. Why should I give that up? You know, and, and also why shouldn't I be taking care of my health so I can live longer in general?
but I, I just felt like I needed to do more, you know, having my background in public health for so long. And uh, so I've been working with the Office of Minority Health, and we have been working on uh, with different groups, uh, with different perspectives on things. Many of the times we just think, you know, um, hesitancy is uh, based on one's beliefs or their feelings about being vaccinated, but there are also some uh, physical barriers uh, like transportation issues, uh, like, um, you know, people who have disabilities not having accessibility with ramps. People who have mental health concerns, and we know the opioid epidemic just exploded a bit um, in 2020, uh, and we had more opioid-related deaths and more suicides. So it was really important to, to reach out and to talk to the African-American community, the churches, um, uh, the Latino community, the Asian community, and ask them specifically, what is it that you are finding um, to be a, a challenge for you? To have community health care systems throughout the community. Currently, we only have, in this town, one uh, health care provider on the east side of town. So that means all the people that are on a, a care program that accepts public aid mm -hmm. or anything like that, they generally can go to one space. But on the west side of town, you have a doctor's office, a clinic, a doctor's office, a clinic, a doctor's office, a clinic, a doctor's office, a clinic. Mm. So there is a problem with the disbursement of spaces. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And so it makes it a lot more difficult for African-Americans that don't have transportation, have a single mother with two jobs that have, you know, to fight for, you know, health care and space and food and rent and let, let like every other necessity that's that's needed to survive in this pandemic. Correct. Absolutely. Right, and so what I see is um, the historical representation of the percentage of support in African American communities. So although we are 13% in the United States, we get 5% of the services. Mm -hmm. I wanna go ahead and ask you if you can share with me your first and last name. My name is Shatria Smith. I am an, the executive director uh, for a nonprofit organization called the Garvey Tubman Cultural Arts and Research Center here in Springfield, Illinois. We need to recognize that there are differences and we need to provide those services for those differences. Uh, and not just another program that, you know, wants to provide a means of keeping you in a system, but a means to help you grow from that system, right? Currently we have a program in many instances where it's about keeping you in this space, yeah. but it does not help you to recidivize your life, your home ownership, your health, your love for your community. Um, when COVID started, I had a per, uh, nurse practitioner mm -hmm. and I didn't feel like I was being listened to. I felt like uh, the things that I brought to her attention were unimportant to her. Mm -hmm. and she kind of saw you as like, oh, another patient, another, another patient number. that mm -hmm. doesn't want to work mm. because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So that really did sour me a lot in regards to um, looking for service and, and assistance in what I was going through. Absolutely. So it did take a lot of time for me to even get the services that I needed. Mm -hmm. I requested uh, a neuropathy check, and I think that took three months. I requested physical therapy, and that took three months. Mm. Right? So. Had I been someone else, would I have had to wait six months mm -hmm. before I was able to get the services that I needed? I was in fear of my life. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of 
the immediacy of death, right? And so I had to do a lot of self-counsel and I went about making my space um, an environment that wasn't a prison, right? I moved things around, I made it creative, I started working hard, I did pandemic poetry. What I find is as a poet, that if I write something down about my angst and how I'm feeling about a certain situation, it will come with a positive quip. And so that has been so helpful to me. And I would share it on my Facebook page with my friends and my family as to how it is affecting me mentally. Mm -hmm. And then it would come with a positive quip. So I was very grateful to share that moment of anxiety and to share the fact that we can do better. We can take care of each other. We can support each other. We can beat this. We are stronger than we think we are. We do better together. And it gave me a lot of hope through my writing. And so that's what I would share. Not only am I having this anxiety, mm -hmm. I am also having this clarity. Absolutely. Right? It was juxtaposed yes. and perfect. So that's what I did. But let's, let's be clear. I still think it's a three-year bid from the first day it started. It's not over yet. We are not done. It's not the vaccine that will kill you. And that's a big deal. The vaccine may make you sick. Yeah, you're going to have side effects, but you're going to recover from you're gonna that. You're going to recover. You won't have that most long-term side effects if you were to get the virus. I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, right? You can't really and say nothing about it. It's just you're gone. You're Very gone. Dirt. Right? Yeah. And we're all going mm -hmm. to die. Mm -hmm. But what is the legacy you leave behind? So are you going to leave a legacy of selfishness and inconsideration and all of those negative connotations that come with not caring for others, mm -hmm. right? And that scares me because there are people that are afraid of the future. They're afraid of change. They're afraid of, of newness. The unknown. The unknown. Yeah. But I was afraid of the dark as a child, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm no longer a child. Ooh, I love that. That's very powerful. Art. It's time to be a grown folks. Taking the you, good you, with the bad. You want to you wanna talk about how grown you are? Yeah. Show me. <laughs> Show up. Show up. Show me. So I just want to say, write it down first. Second, say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Third, affirm it. Right? Pray for it and then work for it. Right? Because if, if the idea is silent, we will never learn from it. If that the silent question, being that just yeah, that if internal. the question is never asked, we might never have an answer for it. Right. Absolutely. So when they say, "Be the change you want to see in the world," I'm specifically talking to you. It's time, you know, we are ready. We have young people that are hungry. We have an ability right now to change things yes. for the better. The old way is not bad, but we can find a better way. We could do better. We could do better together. Um, I love you. <laughs> I love you. I believe in you. I hope for more love for you us. Too. Um, I, I will continue to pray and work to make the community a better place. Uh, and I hope that you follow in those footsteps of your favorite protagonist and do great things and empty your cup 
so that it may be refilled and then you can empty your cup again so mm. that it may be refilled. That's what I want to say. Hope is a spiritual mechanism that needs to be fed each day, even in a system that is flawed. We always find a different way.